everyone, Mrs Hudson again and it's chapter four today. So you've had a couple more chapters since I last read with you and lots of things happening. The story's developing quite nicely now and starting to build up lots of idea of setting and characters um, and, and the different things that are going to happen in the story. So chapter four. The coal bunker was freezing. Lily rubbed her goose-fleshed arms. Gradually, as her eyes adjusted further, she began to see more clearly. The space was not pitch black after all. In fact, a dim light came in through a mesh-covered ceiling vent. The arm, sticking out from the pile of coal, glinted in the soft glow. It was not human, as Lily had first supposed, but an old broken mech limb. It must have belonged to some poor servant who'd got the chop. How horrible! Though it said one thing, no matter how bad life got, mechanicals had it worse. Lily stared at a cluster of dusty handprints on the concrete wall beside her, evidence of the bunker's past prisoners, miscreants all. She'd never fit in at this hateful school. Whenever she did something exuberant, she was punished for it. Admittedly, punching Alice had been a step too far. The other girls were sure to have it in for her now. But she needn't worry. She only had to survive a few more weeks, and then, at the end of term, Papa would come and collect her. Time drifted by, the light fading. Lily became vaguely aware of the crunch of footsteps coming closer. Yellow light slivered through the door slats, and when she heard a key turn in the lock, she lifted her chin from her knees. The door creaked open to reveal not the Kraken, whom she was expecting, but Gemma Ruddle, one of her annoying classmates, carrying a tallow candle. Lily shaded her eyes and stared at Gemma, who giggled with embarrassment. Why, Lily, you look as dirty as a duster. Is my punishment over? Lily asked. Cold and grim, she was in no mood for such teasing. I don't know about that, Gemma said. All I know is Miss Scrimshaw requests your presence in her study right away. I'm to take you to her. What does she want, I wonder? Gemma smirked. Gracious, I've no idea. Would you like me to go back and ask her? Then, without waiting for a reply, she trundled off down the narrow alley back towards the school. Lily ducked through the doorway, pondering this worrying new revelation as she followed the candlelight and the smoky scent of burning pig fat that trailed behind Gemma. They walked up the entrance steps and into the main corridor of the school, where Gemma blew out her candle, for the space was well lit with wall-mounted gas lamps. Passing beneath one, Lily noticed her hands were flecked with coal dust. She looked around for a curtain or some chintzy upholstery to wipe them on, but there was nothing, and Gemma kept marching on. In the end, she decided to settle for the underside of her pinny and hoped Miss Scrimshaw would not inspect her appearance too closely, which was something the eagle-eyed headmistress was often wont to do. Here we are, Gemma ushered Lily to a bench outside Miss Scrimshaw's office. You're to wait here until she calls you, she said primly, and before Lily could reply, she sloped off smirking. Lily was about to sit down when she noticed the soles of her boots had left dusty marks along the hall carpet. She quickly scuffed them away with her toe, then took her seat and waited to be called. Fifteen minutes passed with not a peep from the study. What was taking them so long? Were they trying to conceive of some terrible new chastisement? A cold thought struck her. Maybe they were planning her murder, then they'd sell her organs to the body snatchers, just like the ones in her penny dreadfuls. Or perhaps they planned a fate worse than death. Perhaps she was to be finally expelled. She edged towards the door and pressed her ear to the panelling, trying to hear what was being said inside. It was hard to make out because the thick oak surface muffled the sounds of the room. It's a terrible state of affairs, I must concur, Miss Scrimshaw was saying. But the truth is I'll be glad to get her off our hands. She's been quite difficult of late. She's been difficult since she got here, the Kraken replied. 
And then Lily heard another woman's voice, a sing-song foreign accent she couldn't quite place. She's always was an unruly child, the voice said. Some might say understandably, considering her past. She's been hidden and forced to live her lie. Her name, you understand. Professor Hartman's wishes, of course. I'm not so sure myself. There are always these excuses, n'est-ce pas? She's bound to be worse, maintenant, with this terrible new turn of events. So I thought it best to take her out of the school until things are settled. What things? What turn of events? Who was this person who knew her real name? Lily pressed her ear harder against the wood, but the voices had dipped to a hushed tone. She had to hear more. If only there was a glass or something to put against the panel. She took a step back and glancing round the lobby, she spotted a vase filled with dried flowers which stood on a side table. That would do. She tipped the flowers onto the table and was about to put the rim of the vase to the door. When, at that very moment, it opened and the kraken appeared. Her bulging eyes took in what Lily was up to, but instead of telling her off, she merely took the vase and offered the briefest of sympathetic smiles, ushered her into the headmistress's office, closing the door behind her. Miss Scrimshaw was sitting at her mahogany desk consulting a letter her hair was scraped into its customary bell jar shape and she wore a black dress with dark blue ribboned collar. She glanced nervously at Lily before her eyes darted away. Miss Grantham, or Hartman should I say, thank you for coming. Kindly take a seat. Lily walked across the expansive room towards the two high back chairs facing the desk. A woman in a voluminous black dress occupied one her bony hands clasped in her lap. Though her face was obscured by the chair's headrest, her unctuous perfume filled the room with its sharp, overripe scent. Lily knew at once who she was. Madame Verdigree, what are you doing here? Her father's housekeeper leaned forward and gave Lily a wan smile, half hidden under a black gauze veil which covered her face. Bonjour, Sherry. Madame Verdigree had some news about your father, Miss Scrimshaw said. Straight away, Lily sensed it was something bad. So much black taffeta and poised concern. It was like the months in London after Mamma's death. Surely it couldn't be that, could it? Not Papa too. She felt bile rise in her throat and dug her nails into her palms. What's happened? she asked. Madame Verdigree shook her head sadly. Ma petite, I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but your father is missing. His airship crashed yesterday, flying home. Perhaps you'd better take a seat, Miss Scrimshaw suggested, but Lily ignored her, gasping for breath. C'est terrible, Madame's melodious voice continued. The police, they have investigated the scene, but there was no body, only the remains of his ship. He has disparu, and we have now to presume he is dead. Oh no! Lily grasps for the chair, but it seemed to slide sideways. The women's concerned faces swept away in a blur, and the floor lurched up to meet her. Silence. A square wooden box. A flash of white melting snow. The crack of breaking glass a sharp, pungent smell mixed with brittle perfume. Lily opened her eyes and the haze coagulated into Miss Scrimshaw's office. She must have fainted. She was lying on the carpet with Madame Verdigree kneeling over her, clutching a vial of smelling salts. She coughed and sat up, rubbing the sting from her eyes. Bien, chérie, Madame said. Lucky I had these. She wiped her hands on a lace handkerchief and stuffed the vial away in her clutch bag. Why you? Lily asked woozily. They'd been halfway through some sort of conversation. Why have you come? We can discuss this on the journey. Journey? Where are we going? Why, home to Brackenbridge, bien sûr, Madame said sniffily. 
she stood and brushed down the front of her dress. But I was to meet Papa, Lily said, and Malkin. A sickening dizziness swirled around her once more until she felt terribly confused. Papa promised to take me flying on Dragonfly. Tears came to her eyes and she pulled the oily hanky from her cuff to wipe her face. At the end of term, they're coming. He wants me to fly, he wants to fly me home. Mais non, Madame said. Obviously such things won't be happening. We're going home by public zep, aujourd'hui, and we will have to hurry to catch the late one. And you will wait at the house with me until we receive news of your father, or until his body is discovered at the crash site. Good. That's settled then. Miss Scrimshaw took up the bell from her desk and rang. Within moments, the door opened and the Kraken appeared. Ah, Mrs. McCracken, said the headmistress. Please could you ask Matron to help Lily and Madame Verdigree pack her things? I think her travelling trunks are in the storage room on the third floor. Madame stood and adjusted the ruched sleeves of her dress. Ce n'est pas nécessaire, Miss Scrimshaw. Lily has plenty of clothes at home, don't you, Lily? She can just take a case and what she's wearing. She glanced at Lily's dishevelled, coal-covered dress. Though perhaps something neat and black would not go amiss now, eh, chérie? As they left the room together, Lily's mind was awash with fuzzy thoughts. But she couldn't help overhearing Madame tell the Kraken how, if the expense of forwarding Lily's things was too much, they should feel free to divide them up between the other girls. I'm not sure they'd want that, Madame, the Kraken replied. Perhaps the poor house then, Madame muttered, or burn them? And Lily had a sudden devastating inkling of what her new life without Papa would be like. The landing lamps of the descending airships glinted off the glass panes of the air docks vaulted roof. The building towered above the sprawling city of Manchester like a giant steel ribcage. In its frosty forecourt, lines of steam wagons and the occasional horse-drawn carriage queued to drop passengers and cargo under the columned portico of the main entrance. Attached to the side of the building was a zeppelin-shaped billboard painted with the livery of the Royal Dirigible Company's fleet and the slogan, The Modern Dirigible, Travel That's Lighter Than Air. As Madame Verdigree and Lily stepped down from the steam wagon, Madame almost slipped on the frosty cobbles of the road. She clutched Lily's arm, her nails digging through the wool of the school coat. Lily waited, clutching her small case and shivering in the biting wind, while Madame smoothed out the silk of her black dress. Finally, when she was ready, she took Lily's hand once more and ushered her into the terminal. Crossing the marble foyer, they passed rows of commuters waiting for their evening flights. The buzz of people was so overwhelming, Lily thought she might faint once more. The space held too many memories. She'd stood on this spot with Papa countless times, seeing him off on his trips. She glanced at the brass clock tower at the centre of the concourse, craning her neck to see its spire, which rose towards the lobby's ceiling. Here, she had kissed Papa goodbye, and here he had left her with the Kraken and the other girls at the start of the autumn term. She gazed past the pinnacle of the clock to the extravagant fresco of a zeppelin stamped with Queen Victoria's crest, Victoria Regina. It was surrounded by angels and cherubs and tiny clouds scudding away across the cracked blue plaster. At the corners of the lobby, four oval gilt-framed portraits of the old queen faced each other across the expanse of painted sky. Was Papa up there now? Lily wondered. Lost somewhere in the wild blue yonder with all the other disappeared aeronauts. She stifled a snob and blew her nose with her oil-stained hanky. Madame Verdigree was consulting the overhead chalkboard filled with flight numbers. Her bag held tight to her chest. C'est ici, quai numéro un. I don't know if I can do this, Lily said. Take a zep today, I mean. Her legs were buckling and her case felt heavy in her hands. She took a deep breath to steady herself. 
It will be fine, Madame said. Commuter zeps are a most safe way to travel, not like private airships. She pursed her lips together. She seemed to have realised she'd overstepped the mark with that one. Allez, she said finally, and took Lily's arm and marched her to the gate. On the platform, they joined a line of people queuing to board the tethered passenger Zep. Behind it, Lily glimpsed a bloated dirigible waiting for its cargo. Welcome to the Damselfly, an LZ-1 model Zeppelin. A stocky mechanical porter in a blue uniform displayed the gold insignia of the Royal Dirigible Company jumped down from their Zep's doorway. Lily brightened at the sight of him. He had a funny looking thick moustache made from a tufty old clothes brush buckled under his polished nose. And when he ran down the gangway, his leg pistons clacked together and his long iron arms swung through the air. He reached the edge of the platform and gathering the heavier trunks, two under each arm, carried them like they were the lightest parcels and stowed them neatly in stacks in the hold of the airship. Then, collecting the ticket stubs, he chatted with the passengers in turn, as if each were a bosom pal who he hadn't seen in years. When he finally arrived at the spot where they were standing, he gave a creaky little bow and tipped his hat to Madame, so that Lily saw the polished brass top of his bald head. Ladies, might I see your tickets, please? First class section, Madame Verdigree said, handing them over. He checked the scroll. Miss Lily Grantham? Lily nodded, looking down at the tickets in the mechanical hands and spotting a gleaming brass plate on his forearm. Hartman and Silverfish Limited, first class mechanimal, mechanicals and mechanimals. But, oh, you were made by my far... Madame Verdigree pinched the top of Lily's arm hard. By John Hartman, the famous inventor, the mechanical said proudly. Are you any relation? None whatsoever, Madame Verdigree replied, before Lily had even opened her mouth. Perhaps you should get on with your job. He gave her a curt nod. Of course, Madame, very good. Hand luggage only. May I show you both to your seats? He took Lily's case and winked at her. Or was it an error in his blinking? This way, please. Mind your step. The mechanical ushered them along the gangplank towards the damselfly, and Lily glanced back one more time at the air station. As she did, she noticed a man clutching a lacquer walking cane arrive and join the back of the queue of boarding passengers. His razor-thin figure was clothed in a dark wool suit and tall stovepipe hat, and he wore silver reflective O-shaped spectacles. Something about him seemed oddly familiar. He was, she thought, somehow connected to Papa, but she couldn't quite place him. She was still trying to put a name to his craggy face when she stepped into the corridor of the airship's gondola and he disappeared from sight. In the compartment, Madame installed herself by the window while Lily waited for the mechanical porter to stow her suitcase. When he'd finished, the mechanical man doffed his hat to her and Lily shook his hand before he slid the compartment door shut and left. Madame Verdigree settled back in her seat and tutted under her breath. I don't know why you shake hands with them, Lily. You'll end up covered in engine oil or worse. It's good manners, Lily said. They only want to be treated like people. Mon Dieu, where do you get these notions? Certainly not from that school of yours. Madame opened her carpet bag and took out some embroidery, a picture of Botticelli angels. In the confines of the cabin, her perfume was almost unendurable. Lily reached for the window latch. Madame put out a hand. Arrêtez-vous! Why? I cannot stand the sound of propellers, and I hate to be battered by cold air when I travel, not to mention the evil stink of smoke you're let in. Lily bristled. Why was Madame making such demands? And why had she asked Lily to deny she knew Papa now after everything? Why did you tell the porter I wasn't related to John Hartman? She asked. Your father never liked revealing your identity. Does it matter now? 
Do you want everyone knowing our business? Especially Mex, and especially now your father's gone. Lily shook her head, but she felt a pang of pain in her chest. I just don't see how it's your right to answer questions addressed to me, she said. Well, I do, Madame replied. I'm your guardian, Montenon, albeit temporarily. And until we find out what's been decided, I suggest we stick to the old rules. So please sit back and try to keep quiet. We have a long journey ahead. Lily did as she was told, though she would have preferred it to be someone more pleasant doing the telling. She ignored the housekeeper and contented herself with staring out the window at the view. Damselfly's engines shuddered to life and it was winched by two large steam wagons to the centre of the landing strip. They positioned it over a big X, directly under the takeoff skylight. Then the mooring ropes were unclipped, and the Zep rose through the centre of the building, aided by gigantic wind pumps in the walls, pushing it upwards. Lily watched through the compartment's porthole as the Zep drifted, drifted past the metal struts that held up the glass-paned roof, and the roosting pigeons, who barely shifted as they floated by. Last time she'd flown with Papa, she'd been arriving here for the start of the autumn term. Then, the evenings had been light and long, not dark and heavy as they were now. Lily was flying without him, and she felt danger at every turn. As the public set swept into the starless sky, she wondered what had happened to Papa and Malkin. How, with such an unfeeling guardian as Madame watching over her, would she ever find out? Suddenly, she felt very alone and scared about her future. Wow, so more in the story of Lily, more adventures, more uncertainty. And um, what a scary time for her as well. The prospect that Papa might never be found or might never return. And Madame Verdigree doesn't sound too nice a character, does she really? Um, so I wonder what's going to happen next. Is is Papa ever going to be found? Um, remember that Papa sent Malkin down, and and so Malkin will Malkin find um, Lily? Who knows? We just don't know at the moment, do we? So it's all of those things for us to think about. And you'll be having chapter five tomorrow from Mrs. Gaines.